Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRNAM for Wednesday, August 25th, 2021. And our top story today, financial planning for greater longevity and longer lifespans. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Suzanne Norman is a senior education advisor for the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Suzanne, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Hi, Jeff. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really great to get your insight. And we're going to be talking about longevity, financial literacy. Let's start with longevity. We're living longer. We're, we're going a lot further into our lives. What does all this mean in terms of culture and how we need to prepare ourselves for our financial future? Yeah, it's a big question. They're a big topic. <laughs> And uh, I think we could spend hours talking about it and probably not resolve, but I, I see a few trends. Um, you know, one of the things that I think was very interesting last year is we tracked how many people and Pew um, did the research on how many people retired last year in excess of 2019. And we saw over 3 million more people retire. And so I'm connecting that to your question on longevity because what that says to me is we've got a lot of people out there that may or may not have spoke what, what their lifespan looks like and how much money they need. And so this is something that I think the trend is, is more in the financial professional industry looking to help, helping people map what that longevity will look like for them and how much money they'll need. And one of the things that always concerns me is that we've, we've, we've tracked the adoption rate for financial planning. Um, the Alliance for Lifetime Income just did research on this as well, and the numbers support what I've seen over the years. And that means that two out of 10 investors, clients are actually following a written formal plan. And with that added longevity, it's a real concern because some of these people just ha don't have any idea what, what amount of money it's going to take. Really great points. Let's talk about the, you know, this longevity, longer life, lifespan means the need for more savings. And it also means a drawdown strategy, a disbursement strategy. What, what, let's talk about that for a second. What do, what, do you, what do you think in terms of what you need to think about in terms of drawdown and disbursement? Sure. So I think it's interesting because, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the lifespan has extended considerably. So if we look back to 1950, we look at an average 65-year-old male who was expected to live to 77. Now it's 80. And actually, he might even live longer, um, depending on, on how, you know, the longer you live, the longer you live. You might have heard that before. But one of the things that I think is, is this sort of awkward inversion that we've seen in the industry is that we've got this large cohort of baby boomers that have been using the financial services industry to help save money because we've also seen that awkward inversion of employers paying for, for you know, pensions and lifetime income, and now it's shifted to employees. And so now we're looking at people that are living longer and they're responsible for their savings and they may or may not be equipped for that. And one of the challenges that I also see is that I mentioned pensions before that oftentimes when you worked for a company years and years ago, or at least a generation ago, you actually had a paycheck for life when you retired. And government tends to still offer pensions, although there are some caveats there as far as funding status. Uh, but most private companies now only about 4% offer pensions. So the thing that I think is, is first and foremost in my mind when I think about talking to people that are trying to navigate a, a phase in their life where they may not have secure income is where can I find that? And the challenge I think in the advisor community right now and the financial professionals is that they may have been equipped to help save money. They may have um, to learn new things on how to disperse it. And we're at a time with interest rates being incredibly low. And one other inversion that most of us know in this industry is that buying something with a low interest rate now, when rates begin to go up, the prices go down. So it's a real quandary right now trying to generate income for life 
And this is where, again, most people will say, you know, I, I either use annuities or I don't. But when I talk to financial professionals, they're looking for something to put in a portfolio where they have that ability to provide security for investors. This is something that a lot of people look at um, to provide that paycheck for life and that personal pension. Suzanne, you bring up financial professionals and people are relying more and more on these folks to help guide them, as you said, through saving more and dispersing. There's been a lot of evolution and trends. What have you seen in terms of some of those trends among financial professionals and and the work that they perform? Yeah, I I think um, I have a degree in psychology. (laughs) So I often talk about the emotional landscape because, um, you know, the Nobel Prize um, in in behavioral has gone to behavioral finance or behavioral, sorry, behavioral scientists four times. So this concept of emotions, uh, you know, combined with the investment expertise that most and hopefully all financial professionals offer clients. I think the time, especially what we've gone through in the pandemic, it is a time for advisors to be very conscious of the emotional landscape of their clients. Uh, Mental health issues have certainly cropped up a lot. And so I think the, the modern financial professional is thinking about a lot of these things. Also, what are my clients' values? I talked about planning before, and I think that the financial planning aspect of creating a very clear dialogue asking open-ended questions of a client, not just, I can get you this return, but knowing what are the client's values. Um, Another tool that I I like on the Alliance for Lifetime Income website is is there was values research about income, so, you know, financial security and kind of what investor am I? And I think that the trends in the industry are supporting a more holistic approach to, to advice. So that in fact, when most clients come in, they won't necessarily say that I beat the index, but did my financial professional help me fund my retirement adequately? Did they help me pay for college for my children, my grandchildren? Have they talked to me, especially in the, uh, I focus on women a lot, have they talked to me about the healthcare costs that I'm going to have? So there's, there's a lot that goes into, I think, a modern relationship. And, and a lot of it does come down to being sometimes a financial therapist. It's certainly evolving and needs to evolve quick in order to keep up the pace with everything that's evolving. Let's talk about caregiving and, and that, that's an important part of life. If you have a partner, you're married, you might need to provide care to uh, your, your partner. Oftentimes women are, are bec- becoming more and more a big part in having that role. What are some things that women who may be caregivers, uh, maybe later in life, what should they be thinking about in all different phases of their lives? Yeah, it's a great question. And I um, uh, participate in a series of papers uh, at my last firm where we address this in the women's market particularly. And, and I think the caregiving is, is, a big, is a big thing, Jeff, because what we see happening oftentimes is women will step out of the workforce. And, and I'm sure the audience has seen the stats from, from the pandemic. It's, it's been a great sucking sound Uh, for women in the marketplace or or workforce. The other challenge is, you know, your health is your wealth. And one of the challenges that happens as a caregiver, particularly when women get older, is that their health declines. And, you know, we've got a a certainly out of, of, sorry, um, it's slightly out of proportion, but more women suffer from Alzheimer's than men. So there are a lot of things that that are going on. And so the thing that I, I come back to is, what would I advise somebody who's younger or or at least talk to them about as a young woman? And the first thing is knowledge is power. So the language of money is is unavoidable. You do need to to have the skills and the knowledge to at least be able to manage a budget, understand the money happiness formula, which I talk about a lot, which is I is greater than E, income is greater than expenses. That's that keeps everybody happy and on the right path. I think as a younger person, like I just left a financial literacy uh, coaching session for a company in Boston. And we talk about that time value of money and the ability, if you can start investing, if you work for a company and you have access to a 401k, if you want to invest in your own, you set up an IRA, but the earlier you begin to invest, the more you benefit from compounding. And so I would say that's important. Also, a younger woman in the workforce needs to keep an eye on disability. 
Um, as a woman ages, I would say certainly looking at long-term care coverage becomes really essential. So financial professionals need to be talking to their female clients about that. Um, and then I would say that, you know, put your, put your oxygen mask on first and, and financial wellness is a big topic these days. And I do believe that people need to understand that, again, that connection between your fiscal, you know, your monetary health and your physical health. And they're really critical, especially since women live longer. Uh, Suzanne, la last question before we go to commercial break, and that is, uh, do w female financial professionals have an advantage working with their client counterparts, with other women? I get the question a lot, and I, I might answer it in two ways. The first way I would say is that I, I absolutely see some benefits there in the sense that someone who's walked in your shoes, someone who may have had similar life experiences, can often be very helpful. And I think that, that goes for, for all sorts of people. When you see it, you can be it. And, and I think there's also research that supports the fact that women do tend to have a higher emotional intelligence with empathy and sympathy. Does not mean for, by any means that men don't have it, but women tend to have it a little bit higher. I think that helps as I talk about that modern relationship with financial professionals, especially with women. They're gonna be living longer and probably needing advice longer. Uh, the other part of my answer relates to the fact that there's a supply and demand imbalance. And what I mean by that is that the industry still struggles with attracting more women um, as financial professionals. And we're looking at about two out of 10 advisors, financial professionals are women, meaning eight are men. And so we see women are asking for them in certain studies and they're not finding them. So part of, part of our call to action or my call to action is saying this is a very valid industry for women. And you see a huge amount of professionals that are indicating they'll be retiring in the next 10 years, uh, 39,000. Yeah. And then I also look at the inter intergenerational transfer of wealth. And that looks like it's gonna be about $30 trillion. And with women making up the largest cohort of college graduates and also STEM graduates, I just see it as a really interesting combination opportunity to attract more women. Yeah. Well, Susanna, as I said, we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about financial literacy. Who should help with it? You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. You need a financial plan that fits the way you want to live in retirement. A plan that can help grow and protect your money, now or in the future. With an annuity in your plan to help cover essential expenses, you'll have the freedom to live the retirement you want. This is what an annuity can do. Find the right financial professional to show you how. Learn more at protectedincome.org. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and called Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report, so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. We're talking this morning to Suzanne Norman. She's a senior education advisor for the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Suzanne, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. Thanks, Jeff. Great to be back. Yeah, it's great to, great to have you back. I'm glad you stayed throughout through the commercial. Uh, let's talk about financial literacy. How are we doing as a society, as a country in financial literacy? Yeah, not, not so great, unfortunately. Um, I, I think just having this topic is, is, is part of the solution, but um, I often say that we have a high level of illiteracy. Um, 
So one of the things that I, I look at a lot is FINRA conducts financial literacy um, surveys and studies, and they'll poll thousands of, of people in every state. So I highly encourage people to like, take a look at it. But the thing that I always find interesting related to sort of that, that psychology is that there's a lot of overconfidence because 71% of Americans say that they have a very high degree of financial literacy. So there's, there's a gap there as well as far as that overconfidence. So the thing that, that I, I talk about a lot is that it doesn't take much, but even looking at six basic questions, only three out of the six get answered correctly by on average in the US. And these are you know financial literacy, economic questions, only six. 7% of people can answer six correctly. Um, so we have, we have a ways to go. I think one of the questions I get a lot is, well, who actually is literate? And, and this is a very general comment, and again, coming from the, the FINRA data, but uh, males, older respondents, not younger. Uh, I know sometimes people think maybe with the technology sort of revolution, um, but um, we also see people with college degrees uh, having a higher degree of financial literacy. And so this is, this is a challenge. Um, and I would just comment that the part of it is that we do not have it as, as part of a core curriculum. In fact, only 21 states require a class in, in personal finance for someone to graduate from high school, and only 25 require uh, a, an economics class. So we're, we're not getting it um, where, where we can test it. Yeah, it's certainly an area that I think continues to need improvement. I think we're making some progress, but clearly more effort needs to put in. You know, uh, Suzanne, financial wellness is a term that is often thrown out there. Let me ask, let me ask you, how do you define the term financial wellness? How does Suzanne Norman define that? Sure. I think it, it really comes down to understanding some basic concepts like compound interest, uh, having a budget, remembering the money, happiness formula, as we call it, but you know, income is greater than expenses. And I also think that we talked a little bit earlier, Jeff, on, on this navigating retirement. It's such a big, big kind of chapter in everyone's lives these days, much longer than it's ever been. And I think, you know, since plans aren't highly adopted, you know, where you can find tools to give you some, some um, sense of where you are. And I think the protectedincome.org website that the Alliance for Lifetime Income runs has some wonderful tools there that can very simply, very easily give you a sense of where you, if you're on track um, and some quizzes as well so that you can test your, test your literacy. Well, on the topic of financial wellness, Suzanne, what you've defined it, but what does it mean for women? How do they fit into the financial wellness conversation? Sure. Um, thanks, Jeff. I, I, you know, near and dear to my heart. And I think that the financial professional industry has a, a huge role in strengthening this sort of clientele because we will likely live longer. We will likely inherit the money. But one of the challenges is the fact that research is saying a lot of times that women do not feel heard in the financial services industry. And so I would, I would call upon financial professionals to, again, lean into some of the aspects of, of their planning-based practices where they're engaging on levels where there's, again, money is a means to an end for a lot of people. It's really, what are my goals? And, and you know, I, I hear this anecdotally a lot where it might be a spousal situation and um, traditionally the husband may be the one who walks into a meeting and says I, it's it's all about me i'm i'm here and and you know and you know my wife is not that interested um, but given the fact that there will be that inheritance typically or statistically i think um, financial professionals are are well served to serve the female client raise that that bar and one of the tips that i give people a lot of times is if you're not setting an agenda before that meeting, do it. And the reason being is that if you're soliciting feedback from a client, this is what I'd like to talk about. What would you like to talk about? It's giving an avenue for someone to perhaps participate in a way that isn't necessarily going to be just about the numbers. And I think that there's an opportunity to engage with, with uh, female clients in that, in that manner and making them more financially secure and well. Yeah, when I think of financial wellness, I think of holistic, bringing in on, you know, uh, uh, emergency savings, student loan debt. And to do a lot of that, you need tools, you need resources. 
things to learn that are independent, unbiased. Any suggestions to the audience where they can go to get this unbiased, unvarnished information to help them make the best financial decisions possible? Yeah, again, the um, protectedincome.org website really does have a very easy interface and, and the ability for you to, to plug in to see if you have retirement readiness. Um, there will be a tool coming that's going to be talking about wellness scores. And I think that, that sometimes there's a slight intimidation, but what you just mentioned, Jeff, I think is important, which is it's sort of, you know, you're anonymous, you can go in, it's not you know, necessarily having a conversation with an advisor. And I think just recognizing, again, your physical health is as in, and your physical health are equally important um, to navigating through all the phases of life. Yeah, I like that you say anonymous. I think a lot of people want to make sure they're not giving their social security number away and some of their information, but they need to provide a little bit of information sometimes in order to get better estimates and having worksheets and tools can probably really help with that. Let's talk about financial literacy education. Where is it best placed? Is it best placed K through 12, meaning public schools, private schools? Is it better best placed higher education, community colleges, four-year schools? Parents, where, where's the best, or, or all of the above, where's the best place to, to place this education so that people get it and they continue to get it over a lifetime? I, I signaled that all of the above. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, I, D, I, I, all I, the D, above. I was about to say D. So I would say, I mentioned earlier, I believe that the schools, it's incumbent upon us as a society to have a baseline and some consistency and also the testing. And that's something that we definitely know is, is important for that stickiness. Um, and I would say high school students in particular need it, not to say that we ignore um, younger students, but high school is where the math school skills tend to be more advanced so that some of these concept I mean, concepts I mentioned, compound interest, right? So these are things that maybe, you know, a 10 year old might not really get. I think they get sometimes when we play around with the magic penny formula, but the point I would make is the schools first, home, absolutely, because I think that we talked about values earlier, having a family that can have an open discussion about a budget, maybe not the amount of money, because I know sometimes at a younger age, what it costs to run a life and not at associating taboo with a lot of these, these, um, these aspects of money. Um, and it just will strengthen our society, I believe. Um, and then certainly peer to peer. I, I did, uh, we did share this in, a, in an uh, article that we wrote. I think peer to peer is overlooked a lot and peer to peer can really be helpful at any age. Um, hopefully the information is correct, but I think particularly with older students, we shared a story in our paper of a, a college friend of one of my colleagues who learned everything that she could when she went to college from people that were more savvy. Um, so I think- Yeah, and Suzanne, I guess one group that I left out completely, it just lost my mind there, financial professionals, they really can serve a very important role when it comes to educating their clients and especially women. You're, you're so right, Jeff. And, and one of the things that I, I have um, been vocal in big conferences where I, I basically have a call to action again, that we, who, who better than us in financial services um, to offer and to step in. So two examples that I, I often talk about, I'm involved with Junior Achievement. I'm on the board of the Northern New England chapter. It's a great organization. It's one of the oldest in the world, 100 company or 100 countries serving millions of students every year and it's turnkey. So as you step in as a volunteer, everything's pretty much done for you. What you're there to do is sort of talk about some of your stories, but the content's built. The CFA Society is another great avenue for professionals to volunteer. Um, it moves beyond K through 12. It can incorporate all ages. Uh, we have some creativity there. We build content in CFA Society Boston. Uh, I just delivered some content to a corporate partner um, just before our interview. And I think those are great ways for people to give back. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, Suzanne. Great, look, it's great to have you on the program and we look forward to having you back again very soon. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Jeff. That wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, 
the morning pulse. We're back again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.